The program you are about to hear has been pre-recorded for airing at this time. Please hold all phone calls. Once again, this is a pre-recorded program. The views and opinions of the guests on The Wileener Show are those of the guests and are not necessarily the views and opinions of the hostess Wileener and or her co-host. <laughs> On. I got my glasses on because I'm ready to get down to where the rubber meets the road. It's not getting ready to be no air, no, no dead air today. There's going to be no commercials today. We are going full fledged. Today is part four, part four of LDS and IDMR. Yes, indeed. Y'all know who I am. I'm one of Lena, the Las Vegas Queen of Gospel. And I am so excited that you came back to be with me again today. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I tell you what, I've got some information on that I've got to get out to y'all today. From these two gentlemen, and I just want to welcome my guests back with me again today. I have with me Daniel uh, Johnson calling in from uh, California. And I have uh, Dean Covington Cormier right here in Las Vegas from the IDMR. And listen, everybody, I tell you what, we have got some stuff we got to talk about today. Before I get started, I want to wish my grandbaby a happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, little Charlie. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear I tell you, little Charlie. Happy birthday to you. All right, now, you know, me and Ma have to do that, you know, have to take care of the grandbabies and stuff. All right, so listen, everybody, we got to get started. We have got to get started. I got way too much to do here. Hello, guys. How y'all doing? Fine. How are you? Uh, Daniel, are you there? I'm here. Okay. How you doing today? Feeling pretty good. All right. And uh, Daniel, are you ready for the rubber to meet the road? I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> All right, don't come sandbagging, because while you got something for you today, I want to know, Dean Covington, come here. Are you ready for the rubber to meet the road? Yes, ma'am, I am. All right, well, let's get started then, guys. I'm not even going to waste no more time. Uh, I, I want to start with the questions. Uh, I have questions. I have so much, and I hope I can cover all of this today. I have uh, for both of you. So I'm going to start with you, Daniel. Are you with me? I'm going to start with you, Daniel. Uh, LDS, are some people in the Mormon church treated differently than others? Concerning black men cannot reach every level that is available to other men who are members of your church is this or was this ever true please explain well it, it is currently not true at uh, one point in time uh from a certain point of view it actually was true okay and would you please tell me why uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure I can tell you why. Uh, this is a very big topic. What you're probably referring to is a practice I had for uh, quite a long time. It was actually started by the, the second leader of our church, a man named Brigham Young, and that was that uh, men of African descent uh, could not hold our priesthood. Now, to really understand that, you'd have to um, know what the priesthood means to us, and it's a bit different than it is for, for other churches. It's not something gained by going to a seminary. It's not something you get as a, as a form of study or as a degree. It's not a way of making a living at all. It's not a way to enrich yourself in any way. So um, we believe that it was something that's given by God to, to act in His name on this earth. 
And um, exactly why that practice was started by, by Brigham Young, we, we don't know. Um, he and others after him said that it's someday all of God's children would enjoy all the full blessings God has to offer. Uh, but thankfully that restriction uh, has been lifted. It was lifted in 1978, and um, I guess it would have been nicer if it had happened sooner. So I can't say I, I understand um, how that's happened or why, but uh, I'm glad that uh, God's blessings are available to everyone equally now, and um, I can't say that I see anyone treated differently in our church. Okay. Huh. Very interesting. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question here, and then I'm going to switch. I'm going to switch. Uh, switch gears. Okay. Uh, what exactly does the Mormon teach about? Well, what this is still in the same vein. Okay. So, what exactly does the Mormon teach about black people and their going to heaven? Uh, this person that sent me this says their concern is, as a child, a, a listener learned that the only way a black person could go to heaven was as a servant of a Mormon. Is this still true? Uh, that's not true, and I can say that I've never heard any teaching like that. There are a lot of things people say about us that aren't actually accurate. So what I can say is that we are all, no matter what we look like or what color we are, we're all our Heavenly Father's children, and we're loved equally, and that the uh, opportunities he has given to one, he has given to all. And so there is no restriction. There is, in our belief system, there is no one group of people that is excluded from heaven. It really all depends on a person's righteousness and what his desires are and what he wants. So there is no exclusion. No one's treated differently. And even in the time when black men could not hold the priesthood, the belief was that at some point in the future that would have to happen because God loves everyone equally. And and if, and if you can refresh my memory, uh, because I'm not sure if I if I if I caught everything you said, but uh, can you tell me? Uh, did you say you did not know why black men could not hold the pre priesthood? Uh, uh, can you just go over that for me one more time, please? Uh, yeah, I can say I did not know. I did not know why. It still might be a bit of a mystery. Again, it was a practice started by, by uh, uh, Brigham Young, our, the second prophet of our church. Any excuses or explanations that have been given, and this was you know, well over 100 years ago, have been officially disavowed by our church. So uh, all I can say is that if you look at biblical history, um, uh, God's full covenant and blessings were not always available to all people at all time. When Jesus came, he came only to the Jews and not to the Gentiles. When his apostles came and preached, they first preached to the Jews, and it took a revelation to Peter to get him to see, oh, the Gentiles can have the Holy Spirit, and they can be included as well. Um, so I really don't know much more than that. Any speculation is just speculation. It's not our doctrine. If people uh, really want to get the official story, they can go to our church's website and search for Blacks in the Priesthood, and there is about as good uh, an explanation and official position as you can get. Okay, so do you know why the Mormon changed? Uh, the Mormon Church changed uh, its teachings and its be its beliefs about the uh, black race. Do you know or not? I, I, I didn't. Can you say it again? I didn't quite catch that question. Do Cut Do out. you know why? I'm I'm asking according to emails here. Do you know why the Mormon Church changed its teachings regarding its beliefs about the black race? Okay. Uh, I think our beliefs about uh, people of African descent haven't changed. We believe there are always children of God and always, you know, should have God's full blessings. But in 1978, uh, the, le the leader of our church, a man named Spencer Kimball, uh, who had been dealing with this issue and really praying intently about it for years, uh, received a revelation, and it was confirmed by all our apostles, that that restriction should be lifted. And uh, leaders of our church had been dealing with this issue for quite a few years, and wanting to lift it, but felt they needed, I guess, approval from God or to know, to know for sure. I don't know why it took so long. I wish it had not taken so long. Um, but again, uh, the belief was that, that that last restriction was done away with at that time. More than that is just speculation. Um, I'm glad to see that these restrictions aren't around anymore. I do know that you know, uh, we try and treat everyone equally. I know God loves everyone equally. 
and sometimes we don't understand the way that, that God has worked with with it with things. Perhaps it was kind of our reluctance to share these blessings. I don't know. But again, uh, if people are still curious about that, if you go to the church's website, which is lds.org, right. and there's a search uh, search area. Just type in blacks in the priesthood, and okay. you'll get a full history of this. You'll get a full explanation, and much more than I can say just in a few minutes. Uh, okay, that's the best way to find the answer. Okay, so Daniel, what is what exactly is your position in the Mormon Church at this point? Um, well, I uh, I am what's called a high priest, and so. We have a lay priesthood, so there's no one that, that does this as a profession. And so in my local congregation, um, I serve with uh, over a group of men to, to teach and to look after their welfare. And uh, for us, pretty much everyone has a position. A bishop over a lo- local congregation is just a member of the ward who is called to that position for a few years. The idea is that everyone has a position as a leader, as a teacher, as a counselor, as someone who works with children, and it's all temporary. Men, women, we have these, these positions, and we serve for a time, and then we're released, and we do something else. So um, people okay. that are in the church do lots of things. Again, currently I'm in what's called the high priest group, and generally speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching, and, and I'm looking after the welfare of others and, and trying to see how best I might serve them. Okay, so are there any black uh, priests n- now that you know of, uh, in the priesthood that you know of right now? Oh, c- certainly, yes. Um, it, w- in my particular congregation, uh, I can't think of any. Uh, I know of some from, that, that are from the Pacific Islands, but um, here in, uh, America? in Northern California, it, it, it's uh, um, not exactly that diverse in my little community. So the makeup of a of any particular congregation would tend to reflect the makeup of the people in, in the community around it. Okay, so uh, basically, in, <laughs> in America, what about in America? Do you know how many, or if there's any blacks in the priesthood in America? Oh, I, I know there, there are quite a few. Um, like I say, it, it just depends on the makeup of, you know, the people that are in the neighborhood surrounding that congregation. So there, there's no... You know, there, there's there's no restriction, there's no reluctance. Our, our idea is that every worthy man should hold the priesthood. And, um, you know, we, we'd love for, for more people of, of any color to hold the priesthood and, and to, to be active. So um, it just kind of depends on, you know, the, the makeup of the people uh, in that area and that community and those that are active and coming to church and, uh, you know, it's, it's open to all. Well, from what I understand now, from what I understand, blacks are all over the place. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you can't say uh, it's based on a community or whatever because, you know, you got black people living in, in a lot of areas uh, of the country in a lot of neighborhoods and, and everything to that effect. So, uh, with that being said, you know, I, you know we, we kind of want to know what, what do you mean when you say according to the the area and then of course you got you got the the little guys that ride on the bicycles and stuff don't you have those those guys that ride don't they go in all neighborhoods or do they just go in uh caucasian neighborhoods not not at all i mean those are missionaries i was a missionary many years ago and uh you know they they go wherever people will accept them and talk to them uh um i guess we 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 don't restrict to any place or to any people um, you know, there, among the black communities, there might be a reluctance to talk to Mormons. There might be some misunderstandings because of, uh, of this practice in the past. There might be some hard feelings. There okay. might be some reluctance because of that that we're trying to overcome. Okay. But again, as I say, where, where, where I live, you know, I see more white people, Hispanics, and Asians than I do black people, just kind of in this little town in Northern California. Right. Uh, so, but I mean, we, we, we will meet with anyone, we'll teach with anyone, we'll teach anyone, our doors are open to anyone. So we, we'd love to have, to out, reach out to more of the black community and, and get more of them to, to be involved. Okay, well now, would, would you, uh, I would think that some people would say that uh, the, the little missionaries may be reluctant to talk to a uh, to try to talk to a black person as opposed to what you just said you know you said that black people might be reluctant to talk to mormons but wouldn't it be vice versa as well that hasn't been my experience i mean i uh, i 
talk to as a missionary and before and after. I would talk to anyone that had an interest and was willing to talk. Okay. So I, like I say, I, I can't speak for everyone's experience, but I can say that has not been my experience with what I have seen and what I have, have done myself. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to change gears here. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Daniel, for sharing that with me. I'll be back with you in just a moment. Okay, sure. uh, so so uh, don't don't uh, don't go nowhere. <laughs> I, I'm here. I'm still here. S- stick right with me, if you will. Okay, uh, Dean Covington Cormier. It appears that your founder and your teaching is for black people. Why would we want to believe that a black man? born in 1896 is some type of savior much less god well first of all <clears throat> there's a misconception about race color and stuff like that our founder dr henry Clifford kenley who claimed that he had a divine vision and revelation in the year 1931 wrote a book in 1961 and dedicated it to the human race so in our organization our international president is white our international uh, superintendent is white, and then we are surrounded by, the organization is predominantly black, but we have all ethnics in the organization. We're not just restricted to white, black, uh, it's, to, it's open to the human race. And we're dealing with a doctrine, not not a race. In other words, our thing is about a, a doctrine. Our, our argument with the world is not race, it's not economic uh, status, it's about a doctrine. Okay, okay. So do, does uh, IDMR people have missionaries or whatever that go out and go from door to door and, and uh, recruit people or bring people into the organization, into your uh, quote-unquote class? No, we don't, we don't recruit. It's basically a word of mouth, your friends, your family, people you come in contact with on, as a re- on a regular basis. There's no paid ministry. In our organization, nobody has paid anything. But okay. there are a lot of there are a lot of questions that folks have that we are not able to answer in this forum. Okay. But we do have classes at sixty three forty five South Pecos. They're open to the public. They're on Wednesdays and Fridays from seven to nine. And on Sundays from eleven to one. Okay. Well, you're gonna do your best to answer these questions that I got for he- got for you here today. Okay. I'm gonna do my best. All right then. Okay. So let's let's let this rubber meet the road right here on the Wiley and the Show. Got some new tires. Cause I brought you on here to answer questions. You got new tires? Yeah. All right then. Let's let's, let's see how good they are. All right, okay. Let's do, let's do. All right now. The IDMR. I have something here that somebody sent to me. Okay. Right. And it says here the IDMR are really just another. Form of the Worldwide Church of God, which was run by Herbert W. Armstrong. So a few na- so a few names and titles were changed to protect the guilty, and a few elements of the doctrine were snipped and tucked here and there. But it really ex- it, uh, but if you really examine these three organizations, the Worldwide Church of God. The Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research and the Assembly of Divine Reality. You will come to realize that these three are one. I would like for you to give me your response on that, please. First of all, we are unique in the fact that we are not affiliated with any other organization. We do not teach what any other organization in the world teach. We are the only organization in the world that preaches and teaches and proves that Yahshua the Messiah, who the world erroneously called Jesus Christ when he was manifested through the loins of the Virgin Mary, came in to fulfill carnal ordinances and not to institute a Christian way of life. So we are not affiliated with Herbert W. Armstrong nor his son Ted Garner. We are not affiliated with the Assembly of Divine Reality. We are not affiliated with any other religious organization that use the name Yahweh. We are alone and by ourselves. We do not agree with any other doctrine that is propounded in this world today. Okay. Well, it says to me here that the Assembly of Divine Reality and the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research both teach Henry Clifford Kenley. The Assembly of Divine Reality is a, a break-off. In other words, in every organization, you're going to have to have a break-off. The Mormons had one. The Roman Catholic Church had a whole bunch, which became known as the Protestant Reformation. So you'll find that every time the truth has been presented, 
there has always been a, an offshoot because okay. of doctrinal disagreements. Okay, okay, let's move on because I got plenty for y'all today. You know, I, I just you gotta you don't got talk too long, tires. okay? I, I don't want y'all to talk too long because I, I want to cover what I came here to cover today. All right. Okay, we got, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read this to you, uh, Dean Covington, the Cormier, and then I'm gonna go back to uh, uh, Daniel. Okay, mind and thought control. If your way of thinking deviates from their doctrine, speaking of the IDMR, then you have been tricked by the devil. If you've been a member for some time and questioned the authorities in this organization, then you are going against Yahweh. Because the devil put thoughts into your head and is trying to pull you back out into the world. So when you see or hear something that causes you to raise an eyebrow, you are not to trust your own instincts about the situation. Instead, you start telling yourself that that's just the devil trying to trick me. Speaking of trust, we are not to trust anybody outside of the uh, well, the assembly, because they have been exposed to the truth. They are suspect, but then again, well, sometimes you do have to really uh, rely on the Holy Spirit in them. However, if they try to talk you into questioning anything taught in this school, then you disassociate yourself from them. It's a us versus them. That's situation. Not, that's not true. Okay, clarify, please. What we have is we don't we don't impose anything on anybody. In other words, and first of all, we must understand is that Yahweh is not a mind. Yahweh is spirit, and the whole world is controlled by universal spirit law. And everything about the Creator is not only proved by word of mouth; it is also proved by the creation. The heavens declare the glory of El, and the firmament showed forth his handiwork. So you are not to take anybody's word for anything. So in the in the in the school that was started by Yahweh Himself in the form of Henry Clifford Kinley, we do not take anybody's word for anything. It has to be proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. Okay, I'm. A, I got one more here, and then I'm going to move over to Daniel. Daniel, just hang on. I I haven't forgot about you. Okay, okay. environmental control. How many times have we heard in the class that we have to come to come to class and we have to bring other people to class because this gospel can't be preached outside of this class in order to get a true knowledge and understanding of the creator and have eternal life then you have to come to class in all caps. Some have even used the analogy of a doctor who does not operate on a patient in the street. That patient must be brought to the hospital or the doctor's office. Of course, this is to get you into their controlled environment. The order of the service is set up a certain way for a reason. First, you hear three or four songs from the choir, which are usually familiar popular tunes with new words sung over the music. You have a settle it you have to settle into your chair and relax because they need you to be in a state of mind where you are receptive to their doctrine. There, there's flowers or pretty pictures on the walls within your peripheral vision so that you will associate those pleasant items with their doctrine. In front of you are those brightly colored picture charts in, encircled by reddish-orange clouds of fire, which they say only symbolizes and depicts the spirit, which is a consuming fire. Like I said above, you're scared to wander and wander outside of the camp. They make sure that the one depicting the children of Israel's exodus from Egypt 
is directly in front of the visitors so that you know which camp they're talking about. I want your elaboration, Dean Covington Cormier, on environmental control. First of all, there is an order of service in our organization that was, as you just said, there's a song, there's a moderation, songs, a prayer, and a lecture. Because when our founder had a divine vision, he brought back the proof of the vision that Yahweh gave him some charts. Just as the Mormons have charts that, I mean, they don't, they don't have the place that Joseph Smith said that he had received from the angel Moroni. But we do have the proof of the divine vision and revelation. We also have a picture, illust- pictorial illustration of the physical body showing how that is made according to a divine tabernacle pattern that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. So therefore, everything that we utilize in instructional media, you'll find that we have a Romans 1, 19 and 20 that it takes the physical to explain the spiritual. We are not trying to circumscribe anyone. If you come back, you come back. If you don't want to come, you are not required to come. The class is open. They are free to the public. And we place no restrictions on anyone. So that's based on somebody that's making a statement that they don't have no proof of. Okay, so basically what you're saying is you're not required to come to class. You're required. It's not a requirement. You're required to come to class, but you are not obligated to if you don't want to. We don't have no membership where you sign up, you're baptized. We don't baptize. We don't eat Lord's Supper. And we don't do none of those things. There's no paid ministry. You come if you want to come. If you don't want to come, you don't have to come. Okay, all right. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. <laughs> I'm coming back. You better believe I am. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Dean. I appreciate you're, you're that. Uh, Daniel, are you there? I am still here. Ready to oh. go. Okay. All right, Daniel, listen, uh, and I'm reading the emails, you know, so they may sound a little repetitious, but I need to read these questions because this is what people want to know. Is the goal of Mormonism to convert black people, African people, into white people mentally, thus rendering us safe Negroes? Wow. <laughs> I've, I've, never, I've never heard such a thing. What I can say is that as a missionary uh, myself in another part of the world, I've known missionaries from uh, of all colors, from all places, and the whole goal really is to invite uh, people to come to bring the truth and goodness that they have and to add on to it. We aren't here to spread a culture. We aren't here to get people to leave or, or, or reject the culture that they're from. The cultures all, along the, all around the world that people are from have, have many great and beautiful things, especially to those in that culture. And so the idea is to not replace that. Uh, we, we really don't want a, uh, a sanitized, uh, homogenized uh, society where everyone's the same. Um, okay. I, I hope, hopefully it doesn't look that way, but the idea really is that you know, people bring whatever is in their culture with them and, and keep to it. Okay. Well, this person says, does Mormonism incorporate anything natively African within its religion? Or is it natively European, Anglo-Saxon based? And and basically, that's it appears to be Anglo-Saxon based. I can understand how, how it would appear that way. I mean, it, it, our belief is that it didn't actually start with Joseph Smith in the 1800s, but that he restored... The, the true gospel of Christ that goes back to apostolic times and even before. So because it's, it was based in the 1800s, uh, the religious revivals, that's kind of what got Joseph Smith interested. And because it's based in, in, in it started out obviously in white America, it, it's going to appear that way. You know, the first people who came into Mormonism were generally speaking of Protestant faith. They were, they were Christian faith. They were of... Um, uh, European backgrounds. So uh, I think perhaps um, uh, there might be something to say just because that's what people brought with them. But our belief is that it's not really based on any one particular culture that's based on, on um, uh, universal truths that come from God. And, and we try not to impose any other man-made culture upon that. Maybe that's not always possible because we're... we're um, you know, we're imperfect human beings, but the ideal, the goal is that these are, these are truths that come from God, uh, not from man. So they should supersede any culture or, or tradition. 
Okay. Uh, if it, if since the world started with black people, why should I accept images of Jesus as a white man when no one has ever seen him? Well, um, uh, images of Jesus really aren't that important. Uh, if we want to look at what the physical body looked like of Jesus, the mortal Messiah, you know, we can pretty much figure out what a Jew in the first century A.D. would look like. So um, he probably was not the, you know, very fair-skinned, um, blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus that Malcolm X was always uh, uh, criticizing. But... Um, <laughs> I remember that from his autobiography. Okay, I guess you're trying to make the rubber beat the road on the Wally the show. You go for it, Daniel. Shoot your best shot. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but um, our belief is that uh, he has actually revealed himself to, to prophets in modern times. But uh, you know, many of the illustrations that you know great painters from the, the Renaissance on, on down have done of the life of Christ and all that. Yeah, they're, they're, just, they're just imagining, they're just trying to, to depict something, and uh, I'm sure that most of these artists really don't know what Jesus looked like. But, um, you know, the, the images aren't important. We don't really dwell on paintings or images. What's more important is the, the truth of, of our Savior, that, that he uh, did uh, suffer for our sins, that he was resurrected, that our salvation comes through him. You know, so we don't need images of him. We don't need a cross. We don't need anything like that. That's really the more important truth. Okay, so do you, you're, you're, I'm just, I'm ask, asking my own questions here now. Your, your uh, denomination inside your, your facility, your church, or whatever, you, you don't have pictures of this so-called, uh, quote-unquote, Jesus? Yeah, there would be pictures. Uh, um, okay, what color are, is he? You know, he, he looks... Is he Anglo-Saxon on the pictures in your in your church? I wouldn't say Anglo-Saxon. I mean, what would maybe, you say? Maybe light skin, maybe Jewish. I mean, some of them are actually famous paintings from a painter named Carl Bloch. When you say light skin, what do you mean light skin? Because some people say I'm light skin. Well, um, uh, not not African. Okay, so so he's Anglo-Saxon, right? I don't know that Ang the African and Anglo-Saxon are the only possibilities. Okay, so others in between. Okay, so he's in between. Maybe, the picture yeah. that's in your church, he's in between. Well, it, it depends on, on how the artist wants to paint him. And some of these are more modern paintings. Some of these are paintings done hundreds of years ago that are that are really uh, esteemed as high art. Okay, so uh, what so, what painting is in your facility where you go every week? There's more than one. There there are quite a few, and he looks. You got two or three different, different Jesuses in your church. Uh, there's more than one painting. <laughs> because he, he, Which one do y'all worship? <laughs> we don't worship any of them. They're just decoration. We don't worship any image. Decorations. Okay. And you know, I heard I heard you when you said uh uh it, it's not important what he looks like. You know, you said it's not important. Well, why would you say that it's not important because of what he looks like? For the simple reason, so many people, millions and millions of people, worship this man that is to be the Savior. So why wouldn't it be important what he looks like? So um, many people in the movies, I mean, everywhere you look, you see uh, Anglo-Saxon men on the average. I mean, mostly all the movies that they, that they create, it's an Anglo-Saxon man that's, that depicts Jesus. Okay, so, and so that's the image that the world is giving us. So why would you say that it's not important what he looks like when it's important to the rest of the world because they're putting it out there like that? Well, it doesn't really matter to me what the rest of the world okay, thinks. Okay, to you personally. So, so my, my okay. question is, what should he look like? Well, don't ask he, me no questions. Why not? <laughs> don't ask me no questions. I'm asking the questions. You got to tell me, what should he look like? I'm going to ask you that. What should he look like? Well, um, I, I have not seen Jesus. So okay. I do know that when he appeared to his apostles after his resurrection... Um, they were first afraid he was a spirit, but he um, showed them he had a physical body, that he was not a spirit. 
And um, we would believe that he would be a, a, a perfected, glorified being. So perhaps his beauty would be beyond, uh, beyond the, the, the limits of our language to describe him. Okay. Huh, obviously, okay. Obviously, he, he lived a mortal life. He was born, and he would have inherited characteristics from, mother, so, from his mother, Mary. So he would have looked like the people that were around him at that time in first century uh, A.D. Jerusalem. Okay, do you do you have any idea whatsoever, Daniel, what those people looked like in that area of the world where he was supposedly born and grew up, his natives? Uh, I, I, I have an idea, yeah. What's, what's uh, your I, idea? Well, I mean, I, I've, I've read things about it. I've seen reconstructions that um, uh, experts have done of Jesus. And so he would have had dark hair. It may have been curly. Uh, the skin would have been a bit darker than, than most people think of as far as Caucasian or Anglo-Saxon, as you say. Um, but uh, you know, I've seen reconstructions of what Jews at that time looked like. Um, I, I don't think they look, you know, they look somewhat different from me, but, um, you know, there was some variation at the time. Do you think Jesus is black, Daniel? Do I think he's black? <laughs> yeah. I, I would have to say I don't, just based on who he was when he was born and where he was born. <laughs> you it, know, I'm going to ask you on the Wiley the Show. I don't care. I want to know, do you think Jesus was black? <laughs> well, I, I just gave you my best answer. Uh, give it to me again because I'm sorry. I was busy laughing. What would you say? Okay, well, here it is again. <laughs> I, would say, I would say no based on where he was born. Um, who his mother was, and um, just the people he lived around. Okay. The whole point was, he was the savior of the entire world, of all of God's cr uh, creation, of all of God's children. So, uh, you know, the fact that he was a Jew of the first century A.D. should not be uh, a problem. Okay. All right. Listen, uh, guys, we have we have a caller on the line, and so I want to see I want to see what uh, what our caller has to say. Okay. So so let's uh, take this caller right now. Hello, caller. How are you? Oh, hello, Eileen. This is uh, Larry down here on Lamb Boulevard. Hello, Larry. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm fighting a chest cold, but uh, uh -oh. I'm going to get through it. Uh, That's not ready. good. <laughs> Uh, let me, uh, you know, over Christmas time, they had a really good show on where the archaeologists had dug up uh, some bones, and with the new computers and all, uh -huh. they said Jesus, actually, they, it was about a 14, 15-year-old boy, and they reconstructed it, and it's, uh, it's bone structure and all, because, you know, the Arabs and the Jews are both sort of Semitic people. And the Semitics, or the Arabs and the Jews, you know, there's no difference in their blood. And, and their archaeologists reconstructed it. And they said he would be curly-headed, dark curly-headed, and he would be olive-skinned. And probably since he was working class, a poor boy, and with, uh, Joseph, and working out in the sun and doing carpentry, would be even more dark. And uh, it was after the diaspora when they intermingled and went through Europe and, and intermingled with some Russian, you know, they went all over Hungary, Germany. That's where you have your more Sephardic, lighter-skinned Jewish people. Hmm. As far as Jesus was concerned, they reconstructed him using computer technology and the bones that they dug up and some of the way, and the people of that time. And he would have been more dark skinned than he wouldn't have been white but he wouldn't have been exactly you know african american darker black he would have just been uh, you know a good good suntan <laughs> <laughs> but he would have had he would have had curly curly black hair okay so he wouldn't have been blonde haired and blue eyed no no way he would he was black, definitely curly headed uh, black hair and he would have been a so semitic like you see over most of the children that you see, the boys, are all black-headed over in Syria yeah. and over in Lebanon. And, yeah. and they're all, even in Iraqis, if you look at all those children, they always look the same, black, brown-eyed, yes. dark-skinned, and, and, and dark hair. Yes, I, I concur. You're right, they right. do. And they're just, just somatic, so there's no difference. You know, Esau and uh, 
he, which God, for some reason, hated and kicked him out, Hagar, and then, uh, you know, Esau, I hated him. But they were basically brothers. Actually, the Jews and Arabs are just uh, brothers, and hmm. I guess that's why they fight all the time. <laughs> just okay. Brothers will fight. But anyway, it was a really good show, and it was over Easter, and they really put together their archaeology with modern technology, and that's what they came up with. Wow. So what? I thought I'd just throw that in there. And, uh, <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that with me, Larry. <laughs> 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 And you're not even supposed to have pictures or images of him anyway. So, huh. You know. All so right. Your heart in the spirit. He doesn't live in a picture on a wall. So huh. No. All right, Larry. Well, thank you so much for your input. I appreciate that. I'm going to let my guests elaborate on what you just said, okay? All right. You keep giving them heck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting on that rich uncle to, so we can get our, get some more time for her. Well, Larry, I'm waiting on your rich uncle, too, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for Thanks calling. For okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let let my guests uh, uh, elaborate on that. Uh, let's go with Dean. Dean Covington, come here. Go ahead and elaborate on what the uh, caller just said, please. Well, everything he said was basically true as far as Esau. Not Esau, but Ishmael. Ishmael and Isaac were brothers, but they were different mothers. Ishmael was Hagar, and Isaac was uh, Sarah. And you find that Abraham is the father of both the Jew and the Arabs. And as he said, that's, they are brothers, and they're fighting for the same piece of land. But when you talk talking about the color of Yahshua the Messiah, when he came through the lawns of the Virgin Mary, his name never was Jesus. But he came and he came as the light of the world. And the brightest light in the world is black light. And that's what a lot of folks don't understand. The UV rays from the sun is called black light. So when the Savior comes in, he says, I'm the light of the world. It's not about race. It's not about the melanin in the person's skin. It's okay. spirit. Yahweh is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not about color. Okay. Well, we're talking about color right now. I know you were talking about what <laughs> I hear what you're saying, though. I hear what you're saying. Okay, let me let, let me see what Daniel got to say about what my caller said. Daniel, did you hear the caller? I heard him, and, uh, you know, that's one idea, and that's probably probably pretty good. Olive-skinned may be a good way to describe it. But, again, I would say he, he would have looked just like all the other people around him at that time. Um, and, and, you know, he didn't, he didn't stand out as looking any different from them. So there are probably a lot of people in the Middle East right now that, would have looked, you know, similar to the way Jesus looked um, during his mortal life. But I do agree that that I think it's a bit of a, uh, of a sidetrack to try and, and, and uh, really discuss too much, you know, race or color of Jesus. That's not the important part of his of his life or his message or anything that comes from God. Right. Well, I understand what you're saying, Daniel, you know, but what can I tell you? I, I have to address what my listeners and my viewers want to know because that's what the Wild the Show is all about. Inquiring minds want to know. Okay, so listen, I'm going to move back over here to uh, Dean Covington Cormier. I have some more here that I need to uh, have you to elaborate on, okay? Alright. Emotional control is what this person is saying. Fear is a very strong emotion. We have been told time and time again that if we reject their doctrine, we will go straight to the lake of fire. Even the charts on their walls in front of your face, if you are a visitor who has to sit on the front row, have fire painted around each picture like a frame. They frequently direct your attention to this circle of fire which surrounds each chart. Well, nobody wants to end up in a lake of fire to burn for an eternity, right? Interestingly enough, that concept is from Greek mythology, which which borrowed it from Egyptian mythology, FYI. So we're all scared to venture outside of those charts, outside of their one and only true gospel, outside of the camp, etc. Because we surely end up in the lake of fire. Another interesting point to make here is that there is no mention of the lake of fire in the law 
or the prophets. But in this class, we are told to listen to Isaiah 8 and 20, which says, To the law and to the prophets, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This imaginary lake is only mentioned in Luke and in Revelations, according to Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible. We're not just scared, we also feel guilty for even thinking such thoughts. We feel guilty for even having a nagging feeling that maybe, just maybe, something's not right here. Why is this organization ruling by fear? Why not rule with love? Why do you have to scare people into total submission or else risk being emotionally shunned and losing out on our e eternal life? Quite often, the dean or one of his minions will get up and say that they are people that there are people out out to get him, people who are against the bishop. For years I thought, now who would want to say a mean thing about someone who is generously shares the truth with us? Well, they must be tricked by the devil. People ex it instinctively care about others. We don't want to see anyone get hurt. We always want to stick up for the underdog. So we're made to feel sorry for this dean and his bishop and their founder. We automatically want to protect them from those evil, mean-spirited people who would attack them for no good reason. We never check to see if those claims were even true. That's emotional manipulation and control, the, Dean Covington. The last time I read the Bible, they had a man named Yahshua Messiah, who they called Jesus Christ, who went about doing good, healing the sick, raising the dead, and giving sight to the blind. The next thing I know, when the guy gets to be 33 years old, he's put on the cross. He's never done anything wrong to anybody. But you tell him that you're concerned about people that's telling the truth. Apparently, the truth is very offensive. And the only way that the devil can get rid of the truth is to kill the messenger. They don't want the message. They want to kill the messenger. So our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in 1931, as I said, wrote a book, dedicated it to the human race told them that everything they had been told was a lie. In other words, he told them that Jesus Christ was in error, going to church, eating large suppers, doing water baptism, and doing everything contrary to what Yahshua Messiah had done. And that's the reason why they killed him. If, you could, if we could save ourselves, he died in vain. If eating large suppers and getting water baptized and going to church would save us, then the Savior died in vain. We don't intimidate, nor, nor are we fear mongers. The Bible says the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if somebody is talking about being, trying to incite fear, the fact is that they are, they are a fool and they despise wisdom and instruction. Okay, so Dean Covington Cormier, are you telling me that as a dean, yourself as a dean, that in your class, quote unquote class, you do not tell people that or, or or you know make people afraid that if they don't come to class uh they're gonna die or they're gonna get struck by lightning or they're gonna fall in the lake of fire we don't or say. any of these things such as that do you as a dean yourself put fear in people to make them come to your class our job is to present the facts now you're talking about the lake of fire the lake of fire is what stated in your question is found in luke and is also found in the book of Revelation, say death, hell, and the grave going to be cast into the lake. Yahweh, our Elohim, is a consuming fire. And it was not taken from mythology. It was taken from Moses in the book of, of, of Exodus. When Yahweh brought the children of Israel to the land of Egypt, he settled in a fiery cloud on top of Mount Sinai. And the Bible itself states that Yahweh, our Elohim, is a consuming fire. And he makes his ministers to be flames of fire. So the lake of fire is not a myth. Hell is, is, is a, the physical body that you're residing in right now is hell. So what happened is after you die and leave hell, you go to the lake. Our problem dealing with folks that are ignorant, they don't want to know the truth because they are, they are comfortable in tradition. 
So our job is to present the truth, and the truth has always been offensive. Okay, thank you. Daniel. Yes. Why would anybody in their right mind want to follow a man that promotes and teaches polygamy? Well, that's not done anymore. But, but um, we're, we're talking about when he when he was alive and when he started. It it shows that Joseph Smith was polygam was into polygamy. So please explain. the The question is, why would anybody want to follow a man that teaches polygamy? Okay. Well, there are uh, great heroes and prophets of the Old Testament who live that law as well. It's a difficult thing to understand, and I can't say that I understand it fully. But our belief is that um, uh, Joseph, many of his revelations came about because he had a question. And he had a question about how the, the heroes and the prophets of, of the Old Testament could be approved of by God and yet live this law of having more than one wife. And he was told that this was a law that was given to God at times and that it would have to be restored. So he began the practice rather reluctantly, and um, it was under the belief that it was what God commanded uh, him to do and others as well, mainly leaders within the church. And it was not probably what people imagine, uh, but it was something that was for God's own purposes and um, perhaps served his purpose. Uh, it, it, it requires perhaps uh, some faith to come to an understanding of it. Uh, I'm glad that the practice is over, and I don't have to think about it or deal with it. You got a wife? But I do have a wife, and one is plenty. One? <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is that um, for, for at least 100 years or more, Mormons are not polygamists, and polygamists are not Mormons. Okay. So we believe that this was something that was given by God to man, uh, through his prophet, and it was to be lived for a time. And I say, thankfully, the, the requirement to live it has been taken away. Okay. Okay, listen, guys, we're down to the end of the road. The rubber has met, and we are down to the end. So now it is your turn. I'm going to give each one of you two minutes apiece. Use your two minutes, because this will be your last two minutes on the Wild Lena Show. Okay? So utilize your two minutes to give us your closing thought. Daniel, begin. Well, I appreciate uh, all the time that uh, you've given me and the opportunity to answer your, your questions and your uh, listeners' questions. And um, I'm happy to do so. I think pretty much any one of my faiths could do the same. Uh, there are a lot of people that believe some strange things about us, uh, which might be true. But um, if you're really curious about it, there's easy ways to find out. I'm sure everyone knows a Mormon. I'm sure everyone has seen Mormon missionaries. You can just go to them and say, hey, you know, what is this about? Do you know about this? Is this true? We just are trying to, to share what we believe is a message from God and will be beneficial to, to everyone. And if people don't agree with it, that's fine. If people, you know, want to, to find problems, that's okay. But my hope is that people will criticize us for things that are true and not criticize us based on things that are uh, inaccurate or untrue. And so what I'm trying to do is to, to clear the air, to answer questions as best I can, and, um, you know, no question is really off limits. And I would say the same thing about any one of our faiths, that, um, you know, we're try to, trying to live Christ's example we're trying to love and serve everyone in our imperfect way. And um, uh, we're trying to bring all the good that we can to people. So we invite people to bring the good that they have. And if they're interested in um, increasing that and in um, adding to it, to come to us and see if that works for them. A lot of people these days, there are a lot of questions they have. People seem to be less certain about things. People seem to be very distrustful of religion. And there are a lot of good reasons to be distrustful of religion. But my parting words would be that there is a Heavenly Father who loves us. There is a Savior who died for our sins, for every one of us, and that we can all come closer to God. And we can all have a personal relationship with our Savior and with Jesus Christ. Oh, okay. And, um, okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much. Dean, you coming to the Cormier. Two minutes. Uh, thank you, Wileen. I'm grateful for this opportunity for us to tell about our organization and our concur with Daniel wholeheartedly in the fact that he said that our desire is just to correct 
misinterpretations and rumors about our organization. Our lectures are free and open to the public. We are, we are not restrictive and we're not circumscribing anyone. The location is 6345 South Pecos, Suite 100. You're welcome on Wednesdays and Fridays from 7 to 9 and on Sundays from 11 to 1. Thank you for the opportunity. All righty then. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, I guess I just might as well tell the truth about the whole thing. That's what we do on the Wild Eater Show anyway. It's all the hell with you guys I've had a ball with the two of you for the past four shows I just want y'all to know that you are the bomb Daniel you are the bomb you've taken whatever I had to give to you and you've taken it with a grain of salt you've given us whatever information that we've asked for thank you so much Daniel for being a part of the Wally the show for the past four shows I really greatly appreciate you okay and Dean Covington come here <laughs> Shake my head. I would shake your head too, Daniel, if you were here. Okay, thank you so much, Dean Covington Comier, for coming back on the Wildina Show. From having been a part of the Wildina Show from the very beginning stages of the show, you have been here more than once and more than twice and I thank you very much for coming on and sharing the information that you have uh, with us here. Well everybody you know what I always tell you you gotta study for yourself there's so many different teachers and beliefs out here you will be confused so you have got to study for yourself you owe it to you to study for yourself. Get in those books, encyclopedias get on the internet, get in the Bible, do whatever you gotta do, use what you gotta use but do what you gotta do and give it to yourself the way you need to give it to you. Study for yourself. Don't wait for the person up front to tell you everything you need to know. Get in them books and find out for yourself. Okay, y'all know who I am. I'm one leader, the Las Vegas queen of gospel. And you know what's going to happen. The rubber is going to meet the road. We'll see you next week. Oh, 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 oh.